friends and luminaries. I'm Julie and welcome to another episode of Booksmart. Today's book will make you rethink your beliefs and opinions, so it's an important book. It's the story paradox, how our love of storytelling builds societies and tears them down by Jonathan Gottschall. This was one of those books I marked constantly while I read. I used up over 30 of my little kitty cat tabs because there were so many statements and ideas in the book that I wanted to revisit after I had completed it. Most of the time, there's a couple of weeks gap between the time I finish a book and then create an episode of Booksmart out of it. I started prepping this episode right after I read the book. This is an important book for everyone, no matter where you stand on the issues. So we know we love stories, right? We love fiction and those based on a true story. We love historical fiction and science fiction and bad fiction. We consume these stories in all formats, not just books, TVs, movies, music, theater, even commercials. We are surrounded by stories, and these stories impact our lives, our society, and our thoughts. They shape us, even though most of us are not aware of the power these stories have. They unite us, and they divide us. Gatchel does a much better job summing up the book than I can ever do about what he tackles in this very important concept. When I say stories are driving the whole species mad, here's what I mean. It isn't social media making us crazy and cruel. It's the story social media spreads. It isn't politics severing us from one another. It's the wedge-shaped stories politicians tell. It isn't marketing driving us toward planet killing over consumption. It's the happily ever after fantasies that marketers spin. It isn't ignorance or meanness that lead us to demonize one another. It's instead a naturally paranoid and vindictive narrative psychology that leads us to become suckers over and over and over again for simplistic stories of the good guys fighting the bad. That's a lot to take in, and it's only page 15. Gatchel begins by stating that although we think we consume stories for the escape they provide us, that isn't all these stories are doing for us. We become a part of the story. If the protagonist is scared, our brain responds as though we are in danger. We react to the stories as if we are part of them. That's why we hate Joffrey Baratheon from Game of Thrones. That's his example, but a better example is Nellie Olson and how everyone hated Alison Arngrim because of how much we all hated Nellie Olson. I was a bit disappointed he didn't use Nellie Olson as an example. And why everyone was so upset when Glenn died from The Walking Dead. That's my example too. I really wish he would have given us more examples because I could go on forever. Gottschall travels way back in time, bringing up Plato's The Public frequently throughout the book. Plato claimed that storytellers rule the world, going so far as saying they should be banished from society. This is because the power the storyteller has on us and how we view these storytellers. In fact, we lavish more rewards and money on storytellers and athletes. For as much of a money-making machine as the NFL is, athletes are still second to storytellers. The problem with all of this lies in what Gottschall refers to as sway. Sway is how these stories impact us. We communicate every day using sway. We want to get our way. We want people to agree with us. We, at the very least, want people to listen to us. Every story has that universal theme to it, the lesson it teaches us about the society in which we live. These stories suddenly and not so suddenly pull us, sway us, in different directions. The power of media, which media as any format of story is presented, is stated in the media equation. It's simple. Media equals real life. According to Gatchel, stories allow us to decouple from the real world, but also from ourselves. People stayed out of the water after watching Jaws. Yet Jaws isn't a true story, although shark attacks do happen. Gatchel states, fiction is fake. The monsters are fake and the wounds are fake, but they leave real scars. In fact, we are more swayed by fake stories than the real horrors of the world. That's why Plato feared the power of the storyteller. Gatchel writes, Plato condemned storytellers as professional liars who got the body politic drunk on emotion. Crowd slurped up the juicy stories, all the sex and violence, all the laughs and tears, while also slurping up immoral and dangerous ideas. So that's why dystopian novels frequently banish books in their fictitious settings, because these stories might give people the wrong idea. Urban legends have always existed, but now they spread with incredible speed on the internet. I had forgotten about the Mikey story, the kid from the Life cereal commercials dying after eating Pop Rocks with soda. It's not true, of course, but back then there was no internet to fact check such a story. Oh, but that's not an accurate statement either. With all the misinformation out there, how can you fact check 
anything anymore. But that's just it. We don't care about facts. Facts are boring. Six million people believe the Earth is flat. The idea has been around for over 150 years, so it's nothing new. What's troubling, as our author states, is that young people are now not so sure of the shape of the Earth, thanks to all the YouTube videos and such that are so well produced and persuasive. He writes, for an idea this dumb to capture any market share is an enormous win for the movement, which is another reason I enjoy this book. I love his deadpan descriptions and adjective choices as he describes some of his examples. As he is explaining this conundrum of facts and fiction, I applied it to court cases. And of course, one of the most famous is O.J. Simpson. The prosecution bored the jury with all the forensic evidence and the talk about blood drops and DNA and blah, blah, blah. The media reported that the jurors didn't even look like they were paying attention. Facts bore us. We want the gory details, but not in a boring way. We want the story. And according to Gottschall, the story isn't good unless it's bad. That's what sells. Historian Robert Munchenblund said of the origin of the newspaper industry, blood and gore sold ink and paper. Today, believe it or not, we have it better than we ever have in almost all aspects. And we know that journalists focus on the bad, not the good. Although this is not a new idea at all, let me read to you how Gottschall describes this issue. And it's a complex one, even though it's one that we all pretty much already know about. The extreme negativity of the news has serious consequences for the world. In fiction, things typically get worse and worse until at the very end they get better. Because made-up stories tend to end happily, psychologists find that heavy fiction consumers, when compared to heavy news consumers, have greater confidence that they live in a nice world rather than a mean world. They're more likely to think that the world is a good place where things turn out well in the end. Perhaps this means that fiction turns people into suckers. But just as plausibly, it turns them into nicer people who believe that good people can overcome daunting obstacles to improve the world. News stories, on the contrary, typically start mean and end mean, too. Journalists can't engineer happy endings. They can't deliver the comfort that no matter how bad things may look, the good guys will triumph in the end. If the happy endings of fiction mostly produce optimism, news stories produce pessimism, paranoia, hopelessness, and emotional deactivation. Think about that. But that's, that's what we're consuming all the time. So even though stories teach us empathy, they also teach us the opposite. Gotcha writes, stories in the act of generating empathy also generate the opposite of empathy, a kind of moral blindness to the humanity of whoever is forced into the villain's role. And what's even more complicating? We mess up the facts. Philosopher Alex Rosenberg believes that all, that's right, all historical narratives are wrong, and dangerously so. We remember, or rather misremember, which actually brings on more gore. Gottschall uses George Orwell's 1984 as an example to explain the power of historical storytelling. One of the party's slogan in 1984 is this, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. This is applicable to real society in every generation. Our author writes, our debates about history are as much about competing for future tense power as for defining past tense fact. Let that one simmer for a while and think about all our arguments over textbooks and curriculum. He writes about how our competing myths right now. Myth one, as he calls it, is our noble lie. The ones textbook taught us for years regarding this melting pot of a country, downplaying the cruelty on minorities, women, and everyone in between. Myth two is the other side of the coin, the point of view of history from all those who were the recipients of said cruelty of myth one. And neither side is true. Put both myth one and myth two together and you're getting a more complete picture. But it still isn't true. And here's why. And remember, this is going to regard any sort of historical piece of information. For two reasons, neither grand historical narrative is true. Not Miss One's, Miss One's noble lies, nor Miss Two's ignoble truths. The first reason is concrete. Myth two can be seen as a prosecutor's one-sided case against Western civilization since the age of discovery, and myth one can be seen as the equally one-sided brief for the defense, but they're both distortions forged from edited history. And what has been edited out of one is what's magnified in the other. If you shuffle the two stories into each other like two incomplete stacks of playing cards, you get something like complete history. The second reason these myths are untrue is a little more abstract. 
Neither myth is true because they're both stories, and stories are never quite true. Here's a hard but important thing to try to wrap one's mind around. No story ever really happened. Life happened. Shit happened as people tried to get by. But no story has ever happened in the present tense. A story is always an artificial post hoc fabrication with dubious correspondence to the past. So whenever we encounter a highly grammatical history of villains and heroes, evil and good, we should be on guard. Our minds are designed to deal with complex reality through narrative simplification. We do this by forcing the universal grammar down on experience like a story shaped mold. And the mold transforms the messy past into a neatened up historical fiction. I can't help but think of Chuck Klosterman's The 90s book when he brought up the Mandela effect. Yet we're convinced these things happen of details that were never true. No wonder we all fight with one another. Dan Gottschall tackles a difficult and complex topic, the Nazis and how we criticize the German people for not resisting, that the atrocities of the world are committed by people like us, not the villains whom we place all the blame. I must read you this little piece because I can't even begin to summarize or paraphrase how he has tackled such a complex topic. The behavior of Nazis, Confederate white supremacists, and Dahomey warriors is villainous to us, but was normal and in fact virtuous for them. They aren't worse people than us. They just had the moral misfortune of being born in cultures that we now see mistakenly defined bad as good. And if we had been born in such circumstances, we'd likely have behaved the same way. Someday our descendants will look back and condemn even the most enlightened among us, not just for the sins we know about, for example, factory farming or the out of control carbon economy, but for the sins they think we should have known about. I propose they will be appalled by the way we made villains of each other, by the spectacular hypocrisy of our moral judgments, by the ways whites and blacks, blues and reds, believers and unbelievers, women and men appear as character villains in each other's morality plays. When we villainize, we dehumanize and give ourselves a free pass to sink into the vol voluptuousness of our sanctimony, if not our hate. And in doing so, we make villains of ourselves. This doesn't mean we shouldn't name the bad acts of our ancestors or that we can shuck off the duty of reparation. It means we shouldn't have the poor taste of confusing our moral good luck with moral virtue. That would be as obtuse as condemning the poor man who must deal his daily loaf, who must steal his daily loaf, and celebrating the well-fed man who doesn't have to. What this way of thinking about the past requires, then, is empathy for the devil. We're encouraged to find empathy for the wretched of the earth, the weak, the poor, the enchained, the victimized. And the moral imperative of this isn't hard to grasp. It's contained in the ethical in eternal ethical wisdom, there but for the grace of God go I. The devil isn't the other. The devil is us. He's who I would have been, who you would have been, if born into his circumstances. Wow. So, why are we like this? Gottschall's research suggests it's not always nurture over nature. Whether we are extreme rightist or leftist is not all about our environment. Our genes are 30 to 50% responsible for who we are. Yet our polarization from each other is largely due to social media. In the television era, when people gathered around the television to find out who shot JR or to say goodbye to Cheers, we were together. So while we consume much more storytelling now than ever before, we are doing it alone. Gotcha believes storytelling won Trump the presidency. He doesn't talk about JFK, but I will. JFK chose Jackie to marry, and they were photographed sailing in their huge, beautiful wedding. That was all carefully crafted propaganda to appeal to the American voter. And it worked. Politics have little to do with making the world a better place. It's about winning. Court trials have little to do with guilt or innocence. It's more about which lawyer is the better storyteller, which lawyer is more affable, or attractive, engaging. That's what wins trials. I love Gottschall's objective look at storytelling. He despises Trump yet criticizes the academic world, which is becoming more and more left. In the 1960s, history departments had 2.7 Democrats for every Republican. Now, 
listen to this, it's 33.5 Democrats for every Republican. When Gottschall raised such a concern with his colleagues, their reply, how can we help it if the truth has a liberal bias? But Gottschall thinks it does matter. If we're wanting to get to the truth, there's no longer any balance in the world of academia. And he admits something hugely profound. Throughout the book, he's offended many and he knows it. he doesn't fear them, but he does fear one group. And I quote, what has troubled my sleep is the prospect of saying anything even mildly heretical regarding the left's sacred narratives. Ouch. And then he writes, it would be to cluelessly insist that the facts academics have ourselves uncovered about the deep biases of human cognition and ideology don't apply to us. But because we do know that the extreme left is just as biased as the extreme right, now the extreme right thinks that education is poisoning America. No wonder society is so polarized right now. Ultimately, where does that leave us? An infocalypse, info perhaps? I quote from the author, if we can fabricate evidence of everything, we can also dismiss evidence of anything. Who knew the stories were destroying us? I was sad when the book ended. I thought I had many more pages to read, but the last 60 pages are references and notes and index. I felt I had only scratched the surface of a very compelling and very applicable theme, one that if we all understood, we might all gain a bit more insight into what is happening around us and maybe treat one another a bit less like villains. Other than the book being too short, I don't have too much to criticize. He refused to refer to Trump by name, calling him the Big Blair, which I found a bit unscholarly. I thought Gottschall could have used more examples because when he did, I felt immediately joined with his points. Most of his pop culture references are more recent ones. I would have liked some older ones, like Nellie Olson. The story part of the book was just under 200 pages. I felt he could have developed some ideas further, but maybe a longer book wouldn't have appealed to a casual reader. I know I have turned away from books if they are too long or have teeny tiny print, depending upon their topics. I was just disappointed that he didn't mention topics like the Salem witch trials or the satanic panic in the 1980s, or that he didn't explain how when we learn the truth about stories, there's little backlash, like the Sybil being completely made up. Amityville is an interesting case as well, considering that DeFeo murders were real and incredibly strange, yet it's the fake ghost story of Amityville that is remembered in all its fictional horror. I would like to read a book about all such stories that turned out to be false and how those had a domino effect on future events, how even doctors and detectives and lawyers spin tales that we take to be the truth but are far from it. However, the story paradox was a fascinating read and an easy read despite its scholarly topics and ideas. It's the kind of book that everyone should read. It might make us all think twice before we jump on some bandwagon over a story we encountered and perhaps even feel a bit sorry for those who do jump on that bandwagon. That's all for today's episode. As always, my goal at Booksmart is to get a little bit smarter, one book at a time. <laughs>